Thank you very much. It really is a pleasure to be here tonight. I want to thank everybody and all the organizations related uh, to the center and the university that made all this possible. Uh, I enjoy coming to Missouri, I always have, and I also enjoyed flying in this afternoon because I noticed, uh, perhaps more acutely than before, how much open space there is in this state. There are lots of undeveloped areas here, and in recent trips to Indiana and Ohio and even in Florida, I noticed the same things. Lots of area that is not filled with buildings. It might even be time for somebody, somebody to just tell Newt Gingrich, we may not have to colonize the moon after all. <laughs> just me. Now, now see, I can see the reaction. Some of you are going, oh no, we're going to bash some candidate the whole night. We're, I guarantee you this, by the end of the next 45, 50 minutes, I will have managed to disparage everyone who is thinking about or is currently running to be the President of the United States. So don't worry about it. During the 1992 presidential campaign, of course, between Bill Clinton and the first uh, President Bush, campaign uh, strategist for the Clinton administration, James Carville, uh, put up a sign in the candidate's uh, office down there in Little Rock, Arkansas, with three points on it. Point number two read simply, the economy stupid. Just like people think Humphrey Bogart said in Casablanca, play it again, Sam, which he didn't say, James Carville never used the form of this uh, little phrase that has been come to be known as, it's the economy, stupid. Never said that. And of course, people have added to it, as I'm about to do tonight, other things. Uh, it's the deficit, stupid. It's the math, stupid. I even saw somebody had once used, it's the math, stupid, which I actually don't understand. But tonight, I want to try to make the argument that this campaign, so far for the presidential nomination, is all about religion. It's about religion, stupid. Not necessarily stupid religion, but religion, stupid, more than it is about anything that the pundits tell you it's about. Sometimes what I'm going to do, like tonight also, is to uh, present this lecture in the form of a top 10 list. And I like to do that for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, David Letterman does it, and he's a very popular guy. And, and once in an airport, I was mistaken for David Letterman. I have to tell you, I don't know why that happened, because I'm much more generally assumed to be either Alan Alda or 19, 1980s presidential campaigner Steve Forbes. And I know that I'm being mistaken for Steve Forbes when somebody comes up, grabs my hand and says, I love your flat tax. So, I and the second reason I do these top 10 lists is because then if you know it's a top 10 list, you won't be finding it as necessary to wonder throughout this lecture when in the heck is he ever going to finish talking? Because as I get through the numbers, you'll know we're getting closer to the end. <laughs> so I'm worried about the future of the separation of church and state. Americans United for Separation of Church and State has been around since 1948. We've always worried about it. We still worry about it. And I think we have reason to worry about it. Because there are a large number of people around these United States that uh, have values or make statements or conduct themselves in ways that appear to place them in some kind of alternate universe governed by a different kind of constitution. You know, maybe the one they found in their sock drawer last weekend. Not the constitution, the living constitution. I'm not embarrassed to use that phrase because I think that's what it was designed to be. One that is searching consistently for progress toward the achievement of individual freedom and justice for the people who live in the United States. So for the next uh, period of time here, here are the top 10 reasons I am convinced that the current political climate, overtly and covertly, and in spite of what you may hear pundits on the Fox News Channel say, is really about religion, really about religion. And what's at stake in the debate about it being really about religion is whether we are in fact going to keep the real religious liberty tradition alive that guarantees that if we're a member of one of the 2,000 identifiable religions in this country or whether we're one of the 25 million people who have said no thanks to any spirituality whatsoever, 
they're, and they're comfortable with that. The justice and the Bill of Rights and the protections of the Constitution adhere to all of those people. There are no second class religions, no second class people based on what, if any, religion they happen to have. So the first reason I know it's about religion and nothing else is because one party's candidates think that they are in fact chosen by God. Uh, for the first time in modern history, the Republican Party had four people who originally were seeking the nomination for the Republican candidacy for the presidency who said God had chosen them to run for office. Okay, now we know there was a failure to communicate. <laughs> Herman Cain's out of the race, Michelle Bachman's out of the race, Rick Perry's out of the race. In fact, the only possible God appointee who is still in the race is Rick Santorum, former, gov former senator from the state of Pennsylvania. And actually, if you ask Rick, he would be the first to tell you God didn't say that to him. God told that he would be the next president to his wife, who then told Rick that he would be the chosen one. Rick Santorum listens uh, to his uh, wife and apparently it's one more confirmation that uh, in general uh, women do listen at least more carefully apparently than men do to anything even though of course they are not permitted to serve in combat and should take all of their instruction on birth control uh, from the Catholic Church. Governor Mike Huckabee uh, got a word from God too. His word from God, uh, delivered on his Fox News show one Saturday night, was don't run, stay on Fox, be a commentator, and presumably be able to finish your $3 million house down at Blue Mountain Beach, Florida. God does speak in mysterious ways. Second reason I'm convinced of this is that it's the Bible, apparently, not the Constitution, that's becoming the basis for federal law. Ron Paul, who he says he's a constitutionalist, told a meeting down in Washington in uh, October that he doesn't just get his position on abortion, which he's against, from the Bible, which is interesting because, of course, the Bible doesn't even mention this topic at all. But he said, I get all of my positions. I get my tax policy positions from the Bible, my defense and military policies from the Bible. Isn't he mixing up, perhaps, the Constitution with Holy Scripture? See, I'm thinking he is. And before people think that that's a terrible thing or that that makes him stupid or something, it's really easy to do, mixing up the two. I was once debating Georgia Congressman Jack Kingston about his proposal to require or to at least permit the display of the Ten Commandments in every public building, including every public school. And we were having a debate uh, on Fox News that night after he had successfully passed this measure in the House of Representatives. And I said, you know, Congressman, this is a really, really bad idea because it, it's a bad idea for several reasons, but in no small measure because most of the Ten Commandments and most versions of the Ten Commandments, five of them at least, are specifically about religion. Government's not supposed to be promoting religion. I said, for example, in my version of the Bible, the first commandment says, you shall have no other gods before me. And there's just no secular reason to talk about that in public school. I said, what about you know, the second commandment? What what's kind of meaning would that have for today's contemporary public school student? And he looked up heavenward, and he started to talk about gun control <laughs> and why he was against it, because he had, too, mixed up the second amendment with the second commandment. <laughs> So it is an easy thing to do. It is an easy thing to do. See, we aren't supposed to be making policy decisions based on anybody's understanding of any particular holy scripture. That's not what the Constitution's about. We're supposed to be using the commonly shared values of the Constitution itself. They're pretty good ones. Freedom of speech, equal protection of the laws. These are really good value-laden principles that apply to all of us. I have a 600-page book that is sitting on my desk in my office in Washington. It's called Politics According to the Bible. It gives the author's scriptural uh, answers to every public policy concern he could think of, and there were a lot at 600 pages, including what the Bible says the Air Force should purchase as their next round of fighter planes. <laughs> this guy up here is going, what's the answer to that? It's the F-22 Raptor. 
It's in the Bible, somehow. He says it. See, that's not what this country is about. It is not going to scripture to find the answers to what airplanes to purchase. Politicians should not be having attacks upon each other's theologies or religious beliefs, but of course we're seeing that all the time. Rick Santorum recently said that uh, President Obama, although he, he kind of said he, he might be a Christian, but he was working out of a phony theology. Are we electing a theologian in chief or a commander in chief next time? I kind of think it's the latter, not the former. Mitt Romney said recently that the problem with Obama was that he was hanging out with people who have a secular agenda and are therefore fighting against religion. I think it's okay to have a secular agenda. A secular agenda simply means that government doesn't play favorites about religion. All my conservative friends, and I do have a lot of them actually, and they, they're always saying, you know, government shouldn't pick winners and losers. And I really believe that, and I also believe it about religion. Don't pick. Don't give imprimaturs, don't give blessings, don't give money to your favorite religion. That's not the job of government. So, now we come to reason number three. I'm convinced it's all about religion. Democrats are working really hard not to get too far behind the Republicans on the Jesus momentum. <laughs> Apparently, the more non-constitutional one party gets, the more the other party is lured into a kind of upping of the religiosity quotient. For example, in the week following the release of, of Governor Rick Perry's now somewhat famous or infamous television commercial in which he first labeled the Obama administration as being anti-religious, the first salvo in this so-called war on religion we're fighting, two curious things happened in the administration that was so labeled as being anti-religious. First, the Health and Human Services Secretary Kathleen Sebelius rejected the scientific findings of the Food and Drug Administration and decided to deny access to women under 17 to over-the-counter Plan B contraceptives. This was a huge victory given to the religious right. They had wanted it. This scientifically based administration rejected science and came up with a political answer. Second thing that happened in that same week was uh, that Joshua Dubois, a somewhat controversial figure in the White House, he's the head of the President's Office of Faith-Based and Community Initiatives, he just happened to send out the Monday after the Rick Perry ad to his vast email list a photograph, a color photograph taken by the Associated Press of the presidential family walking across the street in front of the White House to a local church. It seemed to kind of have a backfire effect because if it was sent out, it was viewed as so newsworthy it should be sent out to tens of thousands of people. It mainly just reminded a lot of people that the president doesn't generally go to church. And uh, so it may have had a certain backfire effect. And the president went to the incredibly right-wing national prayer breakfast. This is not a prayer breakfast where you just have kind of conservative people who are a little more conservative than some of you might be. This is a really far out right wing group and basically he gives a, a little sermonette in which he basically says Jesus would like his version of tax reform you know, much better than say Paul Ryan's. Why does he do it? Because he's trying to catch up with some of those voters. I don't want every civil libertarian among you to get too depressed though right now. Uh, God talk overkill does occur. It seems to be occurring to some degree in this election cycle. Just a week after Governor Perry's uh, famous video about uh, the war on religion, once the ad hit YouTube, one week later when I was on C-SPAN, someone in our communications department said, here, here's a little factoid you might want to throw out. You know that Rick Perry video about the war on religion has 703,000 thumbs down <laughs> Uh, clicks on it. 703,000. The third largest number of negative reactions in the history of YouTube. Naturally, I said what woman over here is thinking. What beat it out? A Justin Bieber video. <laughs> yeah, that's true. To have a staff, they know everything. They didn't even have to look it up. They knew that. In addition, the Southern Baptist Convention, not the Unitarians, the Southern Baptist Convention, did a survey recently, they, they released the polls a couple weeks ago, 
They asked the question, uh, would you be more likely to vote for a candidate who regularly shares his or her religious beliefs in public? 16% of Americans said yes, they would be more likely to vote for such a candidate. A whopping 30% said that that fact alone, public expression of faith by a politician, would make it less likely for them to vote for that candidate. Not perhaps the conclusion the Southern Baptists had wanted, but had a good pollster, and this is the truth. Here's the fourth reason that I'm convinced that religion really is a driving force, if not the driving force in this election. Media outlets across the map, I mean as diverse as the Fox News Channel and the Drudge Report, I mean how much different can you get the nose? <laughs> they really, truly, absolutely, unquestionably maintain that there is a war on religion going on in America, specifically a war on the Christian religion going on in America. Now I testified a couple of months ago before the House Judiciary Committee, Subcommittee on the Constitution, now chaired by a somewhat unknown congressman named Trent Franks from the state of Arizona, and uh, the issue was the state of religious freedom in America. Mr. Franks began the event by noting this, I wanted to quote him precisely, he said, one Christopher Columbus was exercising his religious liberty when he went out into the oceans to find the new world and came upon America. Now, as I recall history, Columbus was actually looking for India at the time. <laughs> and uh, more significantly on the religious freedom question, uh, Mr. Franks ignored the fact that there was a set of indigenous people it, right here when Columbus landed in this vicinity and that he and a variety of European successors to the Columbus expedition did all they could to convert those people into being their kinds of Christians and if that didn't work they simply shot them or spread disease to them. Another fact omitted by Mr. Franks. But Mr. Franks, shall we say, on certain view about history uh, perhaps explains why he didn't seem to take too well to my opening statement at that hearing where I said there is a dizzying level of religious freedom in America, particularly for religious majorities, that the only question about some kind of problem for the practice of one's belief is if you happen to be a member of a minority religion or you happen to have no religious background at all. Then you have troubles. And of course I had a lot of examples I wanted to share. Down in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, for example, uh, the construction of a mosque there, the first one in the city, was delayed first by vandalization, second by bomb threats, and finally by a baseless lawsuit filed, among other people, by the lieutenant governor of the state who maintained in his brief that Islam is not a, quote, real religion. <laughs> Johnson County, Tennessee, I don't, is anybody here from Tennessee? <laughs> oh man, this guy's from Tennessee. Two people from Tennessee. I'm not trying to pick on Tennessee. But Johnson County happens to be in Tennessee. Uh, look, Tennessee's not as bad as some other states. For example, Tennessee does not have a, a governor who wants to subsidize the construction of a Noah's Ark themed water park, which will figure including a, a large, life-size replica of Noah's Ark complete with humans, dinosaurs, and unicorns. That's Kentucky. So feel good about Tennessee. Anyway, to get back to Johnson County, Johnson County was an atheist. He came to us. He said, look, there's a, a Ten Commandments display in an open forum part of the courthouse. All I want to do is put up a separation of church and state. You know, some quotes from the Founding Fathers. That's all I want to put up. They said, you can't do that. In fact, when he presented it to the city council, one of the city council members had said, you know, we like it when people come down to Johnson County, but if they don't believe in God, we kind of wish they'd leave town. So with that as the backdrop, we represented him and did successfully get him the right to put up in an open forum for everyone something that uh, was different from this display that claimed that the Ten Commandments were the basis of law in our country, which of course they're not. When even I, a man who is uh, rarely surprised by anything that is said or done, 
or con even contemplated by the religious right. I, w I found surprising the somewhat bizarre set of uh, examples of anti-Christian activity that my two co-panelists, once chosen uh, by the ma majority, uh, happened to come up with that day. One of the witnesses was Colby May. He's the chief counsel for Pat Robertson's uh, American Center for Law and Justice. The second other witness was Bishop William Lorry of Connecticut, who now heads the official lobbying office of the Catholic Church. Many of you know, uh, you thought perhaps the Catholic Church was lobbying on things in the past decades. Now it's official. The Roberts and I began with a story about a sex education assembly held in the state of Massachusetts that he claimed was so graphic that it violated the religious freedom rights of parents whose kids attended the assembly. Apparently, it contradicted those parents' approach to sexuality education. Now, he didn't say what that approach was. I'm just thinking I know it's the one that says, don't have sex, it's ugly anyway. Now, you think about this later. <laughs> now, as it turned out, those parents went to court. They went to court and they actually, the court said, you know, you had a right to opt out of the whole sex education curriculum in the school. You just chose not to do it, so why are you in court? And then they said, even if we assume that you're bringing something uh, to, for us to consider, we don't think that this particular assembly violated anyone's rights. The name of the assembly was called Hot, Sexy, and Safer. Hot, sexy, and safer. Well, Mr. Colby May, the lawyer for Pat Robertson, was there, and he didn't cite any cases that had ever followed this, no other examples of this ever being used anywhere, and this case was decided uh, by the First Circuit in 1995. No courts followed it in 1995. I mean, that was a considerable time ago. I mean, I was tempted, had anybody asked, what do you think about this, I would have said, well, it wasn't followed, apparently it's not a big issue, and if they're still having this assembly now anywhere in the country, I'm sure it's called lukewarm, sagging, but still safer. <laughs> so I would have told, you can't, you, you know, you can't just like throw that stuff out. You know, you can't say, hey, Mr. Chairman, I've, you have to wait to be called on. The Republicans don't call on me much. I don't know why. <laughs> Well, now, the bishop, on the other hand, he was, he was kind of upset about same-sex marriage, which, as we all know, does disrupt the authenticity, the stability, the very historicity of marriage, and makes men from Georgia uh, go astray. No, I know, no, 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 I, I hit Newt Gingrich twice. I said I was going to try to be even-handed about it. Apologize for hitting him twice. Most disturbing, though, was what Bishop Laurie said about the meaning of religious liberty, and that's the important thing. His was a radical redefinition of what the whole concept of religious liberty means, which presents us with proof number five that this campaign is about religion. Religious freedom used to mean you had the right to worship if you chose to do so. You had the right to evangelize as long as it was your dollar doing the evangelization. That's what it was all about. But now religious freedom is not just simply that. Now it apparently is the right to get huge amounts of tax money for your ministries and then to ignore any and all laws you don't agree with that apply to everybody else. That's a radical redefinition and a dangerous one. Laurie claimed, for example, that certain Catholic Church-related charities were being denied grants simply because of anti-Catholicism. In fact, Catholic-related charities in the Obama administration seem to be getting more money than they did in the Bush administration hardly a, an example of any kind of bigotry. Bishop Laurie, though, specifically decried a one grant denial to help sex trafficking victims. Now, sex trafficking victims have, by definition, been sexually abused. In fact, I know some of the people who rescue these abuse victims are sometimes literally pulled out of brothels where they have been working the hour before. That's how dangerous it is. That's how immediate the needs are. The Catholic Charities, however, said that they would not provide any information about birth control. They would not provide Plan B, the so-called morning after pill. They would not, of course, uh, tell anyone how to get an abortion if she was, in fact, been impregnated by one of the victimizers. And they wouldn't even tell her how to get contraceptive advice in the future. 
Now, if you're not going to do what the contract wants you to do, comprehensive aid to sex trafficking victims, is it any wonder that you don't get the money, that you get passed over for somebody who will do the comprehensive program? I mean, this is a little bit like complaining that you didn't get you know, a grant for after-school tutoring in reading once you concede that your tutors are all themselves illiterate. It just doesn't work. It doesn't make sense. It's not bigotry. It's called using your money to provide the approach that the grant request insisted upon. And it gets worse because the bishop also thought there needed to be more exemptions to other federal programs for the church. Catholic Charities, he said, should be able to take government funding for adoption, but then refuse to place children with gay or lesbian couples, even if the city in which they were operating had strong civil rights laws protecting access for the GLBT community to social services. This kind of sounds a little bit like uh, what the right falsely claims are the special rights being sought by gay and lesbian bisexual Americans. That's not true, but this is, this is exemptions from laws. The New York Times two years ago did an exhaustive study over the, the prior 15 years and found that over 200 statutes written in that 15 year period specifically accepted or exempted religious bodies from laws that applied to everyone else. I'd call that a lot of special consideration, mostly unjustified. All of this grousing with Bishop Laurie and Colby May about hot, sexy, and safer, that took place in November. And things have gotten much more complicated, as all of you know. You've undoubtedly seen a lot about the HHS regulations regarding health insurance plans being required to cover contraceptive services. There's been a very torturous route uh, of uh, this statute. It was passed. Uh, the, what is uh, euphemistically referred to as Obamacare passed two years ago today two years ago today. And this was where this whole idea first surfaced. But it took the HHS folks until August of 2011 to come up with even initial regulations about the coverage of contraception. When they did, uh, it created a firestorm and it was revised twice now, uh, most recently last Friday. At the rate this thing is going, it is literally going to be so late before any final regulation on this is publicized that either, well, it could be irrelevant, could be totally irrelevant because as, as we all know on, on December 21st of this year, the Mayan calendar ends <laughs> and uh, we're pretty much not here after that. So, I mean, if it doesn't come out before then, it's kind of useless. I don't want to attempt to explain every change that was made because I do not want more of you to go into comas. but. But remember, never ever did this administration suggest that clearly religious institutions, churches, temples, synagogues, seminaries, mosques, they'd never had to provide any kind of contraceptive coverage to their employees. This, that was never the position of the administration. The original position, which I thought was quite wise actually and quite reasonable, simply said that if you're merely a religiously affiliated, like a giant hospital or a giant university, that, cut, that might have hundreds if not thousands of employees, you did have to provide the option of contraceptive services. And in fact, the original regulation said you could put up, there's a sign over here, it's kind of weird. It says, do not erase boards. I don't know what that means, so I'm not, gonna, I'm not even gonna deal with it. But you could, you could put up a sign that literally says, we provide the possibility of you getting contraceptive coverage, but we don't think you should take it. We, including God, don't think you should take it. We could put that right up, but you had to offer it. And why would it be different than a local church? Three big reasons that I think make a constitutional difference. Number one, most of the people who work at a big Catholic university, Notre Dame or big Catholic hospital, they're not selecting people on the basis of religion to be employed by those institutions. If you're a nurse and they need nurses, they're not gonna ask you about your background. They need nurses if you're qualified, they're gonna hire you. Secondly, unlike a church, these religiously affiliated organizations get scads, scads and scads of government money, all kinds of tax money from all the people. And third, they hold themselves out as providing a public service. I don't know if you have a 
St. Joseph's Hospital in St. Louis. Well, let's say you did. You have some, you have some St. Hospital. Who do you have at St. Hospital? Okay. Who's? St. John. You have St. John's Hospital. Does, does St. John's Hospital advertise, come to St. John's Hospital, we'll make you a better Catholic? No, it says, come to St. John's Hospital because we're going to heal and try to cure your cancer. It's a public service. It's not anything to do with religion. It has to do with good quality medical care. Those are differences that do matter, and they do matter constitutionally. And frankly, I think the Obama administration should simply have said that and kept to their guns, and we wouldn't be going through this charade of creating more and more ways, clarifications, compromises on this fundamental issue. Nothing that this administration does in this regard stops the critics from the, on the right from saying this offends our religion. The Conference of Catholic Bishops has been going ballistic most recently on Friday, as did the huge Protestant religious lobbies like the Family Research Council, what remains of Pat Robertson's old Christian coalition, it still exists, and Ralph Reed, remember him? He's back with something new called the Faith and Freedom Coalition, uh, having, you know, I mean, he, gave, he worked for Enron and it, 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 didn't, it didn't end right. <laughs> Administration unprepared, as they sometimes are, they, they just didn't know what to do, and now they've come up with version after version after version. Now they're at the point where it looks like they're going to come up, they're having more comment periods. This is why it takes so long. Justice denied, just common sense denied, goes on and on and on. Probably you're looking at having to fill out a separate form uh, for an insurance car a carrier if you work at one of these religiously affiliated institutions. So all the re religious organization needs to do is give you a form and say, look, if you want contraceptive coverage, go, go fill out this form and give it to some other insurance company. That's all. That's too much. That's too much. That's, too, that's an intrusion into the corporate conscience of the church. I don't know about you, but I have doubts about the uh, wisdom of the Citizens United decision, which apparently said, you know, basically that corporations have all the speech rights that every one of us as individuals have. But even if you agree that they do, they don't have a conscience. I don't mean that in some, you know, ethical sense. I mean, we should not conceive of religious institutions as having a conscience right that trumps the individual conscience right of a woman employee to decide that she's going to make up her mind about the morality of contraceptive use and not pay attention to any papal decree and not pay any attention on the views of some religious uh, lobbyist in Washington, uh, lobby run by all, all men. I mean, they're, not, they're simply not going to do that. And I think that, that we should get over the fiction that corporations have a conscience, even if they're religious corporations, and try to figure out how in a comprehensive healthcare system we can allow individual employees to make their truly respected individual conscientious choice. Here's a second reason that no matter what this administration does about this matter, the big lobbyists, Catholic and Protestant lobbies in Washington are again it. They want every single employer, every single employer with a religious objection to be able to veto coverage of any immoral medical practice. I mean, that's their bottom line. Anthony Piccarello, some of you may have heard a little debate I had with him on the Diane Rehm show recently. He's the general counsel for the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. He said to USA Today, there's been a lot of talk in the last couple days about compromise, but it sounds to us like a way to turn down the heat, to placate people without doing anything in particular. He cited that any of these forms of coverage would create, I'm quoting Mr. Piccarello, they would create for good Catholic business people who can't in good conscience cooperate with this a big problem. If I quit my job, not too likely, and opened a Taco Bell, I'd be covered by the mandate. In other words, Mr. Piccarello doesn't want to be covered by anything because as a Catholic employer, he apparently believes that those overpaid Taco Bell employees who want to engage in what somebody recently referred to as recreational sex, I'm unaware of any other kind, can just buy it themselves. Can you imagine this? 
He wants everybody. Where does this go? What about a Jehovah's Witness employer? There are plenty of Jehovah's Witnesses in this country. They employ people in jobs, in bookstores, and restaurants. What if they said, look, you know, we don't believe in blood transfusions and we are not going to cover surgery in our medical plan because many surgeries require blood transfusions. Or how about if you're a Scientologist, you're not a fan of psychiatry, I'll tell you that. You just don't cover any mental health counseling in your plan. Is this really the way we want to run a health care system where everybody with some kind of constraint says, well, we're, we're not covering it because it would violate our conscience. Now, some people might say, well, those examples Lynn uses Jehovah's Witnesses and, and Scientology. I mean, those are kind of new religions. I mean, the Catholic Church has been against this contraception thing forever. Not true. Not true. In fact, the Catholic Church wasn't always against abortion. They didn't believe that uh, abortion was murder for a very simple theological reason. They didn't believe the soul entered the body until not even birth. 30 days after birth, if you were a male, 60 days if you were a <laughs> see, let, let's see again, I'm just stating the truth here. People laughing. There's nothing funny about this. You know why this is true, right? You know why this is true because men always need extra time to get anything right, including the answer to the question, where am I? So that's why. And the first papal encyclical uh, on contraception, hardly an ancient document, uh, it was uh, written in 1930. So this is not that long standing. This is just something that has now come up once again as a major issue in this political campaign. The sixth reason I say that this uh, religion is what it's all about, following up on this notorious Citizens United case, is elevated talk that even tax-exempt churches ought to be allowed to engage in partisan politicking from the pulpit. What could possibly go wrong if every church, from the little brown church in the veil all the way to the big mega ministries that are on TV, could all of a sudden start writing checks taking money from the collection plate, sending it to their favorite candidate, because money is speech. Remember, we learned that from Citizens United. You could just endorse candidates from the pulpit. It would be a free-for-all. What could be wrong with that? Remember the first primary in the Republican Party was in Iowa. It was a long time ago. In fact, it was so long ago, I, I, I kind of think dinosaurs were still walking the earth at that time. Remember, on election night, it looked like uh, Rick Santorum had lost by uh, eight votes. And then they did a recount, and it turned out he won by 34 votes. His extraordinary showing in the Iowa caucuses was because ministers, evangelical conservative ministers, supported his candidacy. But, to our knowledge, they did not violate federal tax law by doing so because they did it outside of their church as individuals. They didn't want to run afoul of the uh, tax code. What they tried to do was permitted by tax law and common sense. As an individual, no matter what you do, you ought to have the right to participate politically if you, if you choose to do so. North Carolina Congressman Walter Jones has been trying to change this for years. He's been trying to allow religious institutions to be permitted to endorse or oppose candidates for public office using resources of the church itself. And I'm sorry to say that for the first time this, he has a bipartisan proposal to do that co-sponsored uh, by Emmanuel Cleaver, who some of you know, right here in the neck of the Midwestern woods. Um, this is a very bad idea. It's a very bad idea for charities in general or churches only or any combination of the two to be allowed to divert funds given for charitable purposes to the partisan electoral process. This is not about talking about political issues. You can do that from the pulpit. You can be pro-choice, anti-choice, pro-labor, anti you can do anything from the pulpit. But endorsing candidates is the one small price you pay for getting the enormous benefit, enormously valuable benefit of a tax exemption for your <coughs> church, big or small. And it's all consistent with the best of our history. You know, Dr. King spoke in a church, a synagogue, another religious uh, edifice almost every day of his adult life. And never once, never once did he tell a gathering there or a congregation in any of those places for whom to vote. Never. In the heart of the civil rights strife. Because he knew that was not the place to do partisan politicking. The seventh clue 
that I have about why this is so much about religion is because the talk about education, of which is always talk in a presidential race, but it's become downright biblical. Most of the uh, changes that are being sought in the educational system are thinly disguised efforts to subsidize private religious schools. That's really what it's all about. Rick Santorum has even attacked uh, President Obama's plans to get more scholarship aid for young people to go to colleges and to universities. Why? He says because this is part of a plot on the part of the Obama administration to have more kids go to college so that they will become secularized. Yeah. Since the 2002 decision, five to four, but remember five wins, of the United States Supreme Court and the Cleveland School Voucher Program, vouchers have theoretically been possible uh, to be implemented in every state in the United States. But so far, not a single state has passed a school voucher law that has gone and been challenged and has survived challenge under state constitutions. I just got an email uh, today that uh, in, in Indiana there is a voucher program. The Indiana Supreme Court this morning said that it's going to consider that. But th up to now, none has survived scrutiny under state constitutions. It hasn't stopped the ideologues, though. I thought it was a bad decision when it came down five to four, but now there's growing evidence about whether school vouchers even work. I mean, you would think that if we're going to have a program or expand it or grow it in some other city or state, it ought to work. It ought to improve academic performance. But here's what the latest studies show. In Milwaukee, the home of the oldest voucher program, no academic difference between the schools, students who got the vouchers, went to private schools, and their peers left in the public schools. Uh, the Cleveland, the subject of the school voucher case in the Supreme Court, no evidence of academic improvement. And in the District of Columbia, where we have had forced upon us a school voucher program by Congress, students in the voucher schools do know better than they do in the public schools. And in fact, the students were asked about, do they feel a general improvement in safety? No. Do they feel better about going to school? Are they more satisfied with their school? No difference between where their new school is and where their old school was. It is a total fiasco. Total fiasco. Now one of the heroes of the anti-voucher movement is a woman who started the voucher movement. Her name is Diane Rabbit. She's an education specialist up in New York City. About a year ago, she wrote a book in which she described the failures of vouchers and of their kissing cousins at charter schools, conceding that most of her life's work was in error. Can you believe this? You know, she was asked by the New York Times, well, why'd you alter your position after you, uh, you know, were so gung-ho for all this in the past? She quoted the great economist John Maynard Keynes, when the facts change, I change my mind. Members of Congress, not so clear about that principle. <laughs> Hers is an act of rare courage, a rare courage in, in these times. And for the first time, by the way, in the modern history, a majority of Americans in one poll actually now oppose vouchers. We never could get, get to about 40%, then you have to struggle. 51% in the latest poll. People know this is flim flam. They know it, the more evidence that comes out, the more clear it is that this is all a scam. But this, again, not stop the ideologues. Uh, Newt Gingrich loves vouchers. Romney likes them in a kind of means-tested kind of way, as he describes it. Santorum wants them even for homeschoolers. All of his kids are homeschooled. Wonder why he wants them. I mean, I know why he wants the kids. It's just the homeschool <laughs> vouchers. And, and even President Obama, to his discredit, I mean, the mayor of Washington and I had a press conference one day urging him in that big omnibus spending bill. The Republicans in the House had forced the D.C. voucher program to continue, made one last effort unsuccessfully to have Obama change his mind. Uh, all this to appease a weepy John Boehner, who also, with no evidence, supports vouchers. I don't mind if men cry. I just hope if they're going to do it, they would cry about the right things. And to watch John Boehner crying while discussing school vouchers was truly a memorable afternoon. <laughs> okay, here's the eighth reason. Democrats and Republicans are starting to get attached to a very bad idea. It started in the Bush administration. It has 
continued and even grown in this administration, the faith-based initiative, remember that? This is where faith-based institutions that do work in the community now believe they are obviously entitled to get tax dollars to do their work without even having to prove that their work is any good. One real tragedy of the Obama administration continued commitment to the old faith-based initiative of Barack Obama is that it normalizes something that is quite abnormal in American history. We have always said religious institutions make it or break it on their own. We don't subsidize them. We don't pay the pastor when people haven't you know, put enough in the collection plate because they don't like his sermons. They don't run to somebody else to pay for it. If their roof is leaking, you ask people to dig deeper into your own pocket as a parishioner. You don't run to the federal or state government saying, fix my roof. But this is all being turned on its head now. And the idea of equal access to money by religious and secular groups is becoming the norm in a lot of states and to a real degree in the federal government. And that's a terribly mistaken idea. First Amendment says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, which has always meant, until very recently at least, that we don't pass appropriations for those entities either. Religion makes it or breaks it on the strength of its message, not on the favorites or the favors that it gets from government. For the past three years, the Obama administration has done absolutely nothing, I'm sorry to say, nothing to fix the constitutional defects in George Bush's original creation of the faith-based office, um, including ones that he specifically decried when he was a candidate. President Obama, as candidate Obama, said one thing he would stop immediately was discriminatory hiring. If you get a government grant or contract, you can't discriminate in who you hire to run the secular part of this program. It makes perfectly good common sense, and he took that position. Unfortunately, now three years plus into the administration, he has not changed a single regulation, and discriminatory groups are getting scads of your money. How much money? World Vision is an anti-poverty group. It operates in the United States and also around the world. It refuses to hire any non-Trinitarian Christians for any job. If any of you Unitarians snuck in tonight, you are out of luck. And even if you're in a predominantly Muslim or Hindu country, you say that to World Vision, they don't hire you. When asked by a reporter for the Global Post, a, a respectable, I think, uh, international publication, uh, one of the leaders of World Vision said that, uh, that there's nothing discriminatory about their policy. Uh, he, he's quoted as saying, we, t we tell people in advance that we don't hire non-Christians, so it's not discrimination. <laughs> now, wait a second. Ms. Parks, we told you when you bought the ticket, you have to sit at the back of the bus. Don't go telling us we're a bunch of bigots by making you do so. We told you. That's an absurd. Who in the world thinks that this is a moral principle that is acceptable in the civil rights rubric that we have crafted in the United States of America? Nobody. But this continues and grows, sadly, in this administration. I'll tell you, in the greed of some of these groups, and I call it greed, and I know that's controversial, but it, it's, it's just insufferable. In a lot of communities, Catholic Charities and the Salvation Army, which is a Christian denomination, as well as the domestic arm of World Vision, suck up such a high percentage of, of funding that about one-third of the smaller shelters and agencies and crisis centers and counseling programs have gone out of business since 2008. A third of them have disappeared from your community because more of the money goes to the people who have the clout in Washington. And uh, needless to say, I'm sure this is just completely at random, but a lot of skilled social workers have lost their jobs in those cuts because people in the local church, whether they're qualified or not, are a lot cheaper than those skilled social workers. Sometimes they say, look, if you make us abide by civil rights laws, they said this in the District of Columbia when, when we were trying to pass and did pass the same-sex marriage bill, marriage equality bill. They said, if you do that, well, we might have to give some benefits to same-sex couples, and we're against that. In fact, if you pass this bill, we are going to take all of our social services out of District of Columbia and move it to some other state. Now, there's a real moral position. Yeah, we know people are hungry and in need, but we're moving out. 
because we don't like civil rights laws. Well, what they did, of course, they backed down. The city council passed the bill. The mayor signed it. They backed down. Turned out they, they only got out of the adoption business. It turned out they only had 30 through 34 kids eligible in the first place. And all of those kids were immediately picked up by secular uh, social service agencies or some religious social service agencies that weren't stuck in the 12th century. It all worked out for the kids. Sometimes when you call someone's bluff, it's a very good thing because you learn what they're made of and you learn what they're simply making up as they go along. Ninth problem, at the non-presidential level at the moment, it'll become a presidential issue. We're learning that politicians love states' rights unless those pesky state constitutions do happen to protect religious minorities from having to shell out money for the activities of religious majorities. And if you don't know it now, I'm about to tell you, this is before the Senate right here in Missouri, uh, an effort to change your state constitution to eliminate the provision that guarantees a strong separation of church and state. In the state of Florida, which I'm visiting all the time, it seems, there is a ballot initiative to do the same thing, literally erase from the Florida constitution the provision that guarantees a separation of church and state. And we use those laws and we use those provisions because they transcend, they're stronger than the federal constitution. Justice William Rehnquist wrote an opinion, I think it's the best opinion he ever wrote, it was a 7-2 decision in a somewhat obscure case called Davey versus Locke, here are the facts, which is why state constitutions like yours are so important. In the state of Washington, Washington had a scholarship program, but they didn't give scholarships to divinity students. They said, that's, that's, we're funding religion that way. We don't want to do that. We'll, we'll fund you. If you want to be a lawyer, we'll fund that. Social work, we'll fund that. Not religion. That's different under our state constitution. Justice Rehnquist, writing for the uber majority in that case, said, uh, look, uh, he said, I don't like this policy, I didn't, but I didn't write the constitution. States have a right to be more protective of what they define as religious liberty, which is not paying for somebody else's religion, than we do here in the federal government. And we let the decision of the Washington Supreme Court stand. So he did not get his scholarship, and the majority of the court said that's okay. That's really important. That has really irritated the religious right. That's why they're trying in Missouri and in Florida to erase those provisions from your constitution so they don't have to be worried that someone will actually get to use it to defend against money going to religious education, religious social services, evangelism in your state. Final piece of evidence that religion is so important is the way that we're now nearly apocalyptically talking about what the federal courts do. Now remember, the federal courts are not liked by the religious right, why? Because a lot of, apparently the Supreme Court of the United States in 1961 and 62, when they said that government-sponsored prayer in public schools was unconstitutional, uh, they were obviously on dope at that time because it was the 60s. So they've never liked, they haven't liked the court about this matter forever. And now they are starting to challenge the very legitimacy of the federal judiciary. Rick Santorum, see now I've hit him three times, right? So. I'm trying to be fair. Satan is attacking the great institutions of America using the voices of pride, vanity, and sensuality as the root to attack all of the strong plants that had deeply rooted in the American tradition. See, that's not just saying something wrong with the courts and the schools. That's saying it's literally satanic. It's not a challenge merely to a couple of the moderate to slightly liberal judges that Barack Obama has been somewhat belatedly trying to get onto the federal judiciary. This is a challenge to the very independence of the federal courts in the first place. The new mantra of the religious right is that we don't have three co-equal branches of government. The courts are inferior. They're an inferior branch. They don't have final authority. Some even question the principle that was established in Marbury versus Madison, for these, those of you who are law students, in 1803, that the Supreme Court can declare acts of Congress unconstitutional. 
Mr. Uh, Gingrich has uh, serious doubts about that. And where does that logic lead Mr. Gingrich? Mr. Gingrich noted a couple of weeks ago that judges should be accountable to the president and to Congress for their rulings, saying that if a judge makes a ruling that is disfavored by the United States Congress, Congress should be given the power to send federal marshals to require the attendance of that judge in a hearing in the House or Senate to explain their rulings. Can you believe, we're in the 21st century. I mean, most of us are in the 21st century. He calls out by name a specific judge who's kind of, uh, it warms the cockles of the hearts of it, Americans United. Newt's always talking about a guy from San Antonio, Texas named Fred Beery. He's back in the news just yesterday. Because Judge Beery granted us a temporary restraining order last June in a case where a family was challenging the a use of several prayers in a high school graduation at the public high school. And Judge Beery said that's wrong, it's inconsistent with the law as it is, I'm granting a temporary restraining order. For that crime against somebody, uh, Mr. Gingrich now calls him out and specifically mentions he's the kind of judge that ought to be hauled before Congress. In a uh, speech he gave last October, he said of Mr. Beery that he should be summarily dismissed from office. He didn't say who was going to do it. I think at that time Mr. Gingrich thought he had already been elected president. <laughs> tell him he wasn't. At the same time, we tell him we don't have to colonize the moon. <laughs> With the end. See, we got to 10. I'm lied to you, though, because I have 30 seconds more of something I'd like to say. Um, this lecture may have depressed some of you because you go, man, it's bad. There's a lot of stuff happening. It's under the radar, it's on the radar, it's over the radar, it's bad. Um, but even political leaders many of you like, I maybe mentioned them and you said, oh, I didn't know he had done that. I didn't know they were proposing that. And I don't want to depress you all. Uh, the only way that I'd be depressed is if you assume that because all these bad things are happening, you don't have any power to do anything about it. Because we do prove time and time again that Americans United through our litigation program, through our statewide advocacy, through our federal lobbying that we do and report because that's what the law requires of us, that we do all these things only because we have the help of a lot of people around the country, many of whom are here. I don't presume all of you agree with everything or even anything I said, but I know, because I know some of you, you buy into this idea that the greatest thing that this country has created as an intellectual idea for the world is a separation of church and state. Just look at the places where we don't apply that principle. Look at the places where church or mosque or any other religious entity control the culture, control the politics, control everything, and you will find a place that is far less friendly to diversity, to ideas, to scholarship, to learning than what we have in the United States. So the only problem, the only thing that would depress me is if you said, you know what, I'm giving up on all of this. The only way we're going to lose with absolute certainty is if we give up the fight, we lose the heart and soul of the First Amendment at the same time. If we give up, it's like a suicide pact uh, that we're making with the Constitution as we understand it. And I hope we're not going there. Great constitutionalist justice, uh, learned hand once wrote, liberty lies in the hearts of men and women. When it dies there, there's no constitution, no law, no court that can save it. If we keep up to our goal for what we want to see this country remain, a country that protects the First Amendment rights of everyone, whether we like them, understand them, agree with them or not, then we lose everything for us, for our kids, for our grandchildren, for generations that will wonder where we were when these bad things were happening and we didn't pick up that mouse and click onto a website and send some message to our elected official. But we weren't out there learning what people from every level, from the presidency down to the school board, think about church and state, what they mean when they say they're in favor of religious freedom. Is it the real religious freedom or something they just made up? If we keep at these politicians, if we become the counterweight to the interest groups that I've talked about tonight, then we know we can win. Do we win every time? No. But we lose every time when we give up before it's over. I'd like to thank those of you who do, in fact, work with us 
in any capacity with Americans United, with any of our brothers, sister organizations, with the religious denominations that work with us. Thank you for the work that you do because you make it possible for those of us sitting around in Washington to know that we have the backup we need to get the job done. And if you don't agree, uh, this is a good time to ask me some questions. Uh, and I'd be happy to entertain those for the next 20 minutes or so and uh, appreciate very much your coming uh, to listen to this tonight. Thanks so much.